What's up everybody and welcome to Dota Underlords Season 1. My name is Alex and if you're new to the channel I cover a lot of Dota Underlords based content including strategies, guides, and gameplays. But today what I have for you is a straightforward beginner's guide, a full length video that's going to help you get prepared for your matches in Dota Underlords. We're going to be talking about 5 primary things. The first, Heroes and Alliances. The second, uh, we're going to talk about core gameplay mechanics. The third, we're going to talk about uh, hero positioning. The fourth, we're going to talk about gold management. And finally, we're going to talk about when to pick which Underlord, and we're going to do a breakdown of the different Underlords. Now, if you're new to the game, this is the perfect guide for you. Be sure to watch the entire thing. And if you're returning after, you know, an absence in beta, this is perfect as well, because it's going to bring you right back up to speed. Now, let's get started with our first topic, which is Heroes and Alliances. Alright everyone, so the first topic of discussion is alliances. Now what we got here is we have all the different alliances that are represented in Dota Underlords. What you need to know is that each alliance provides a bonus. So in this circumstance you have assassins, they'll provide uh, that critical chance and wound bonus uh, for every time you have uh, three or six assassins on there. Uh, you can tell how many assassins are required to complete each tier based on the number of little blocks uh, that you see uh, beside the little logo. For instance, Dragon only requires two. Uh, Bloodbound will only require two as well and Healers requires two or or four and uh, the way that works is uh, if you only have two your healing is amplified by 25% if you happen to have four you get amplified by 50% okay so each of these has a variety of different units that are uh, some of which are new to season one a lot of changes we made like anybody that was in beta is going to be unfamiliar with the fact that axe is now a tier five unit um, so when you click on each individual uh, you know uh, alliance you are listed there the different uh, units that are available so here we have five uh, different units actually yeah it's five it's six units. I got confused there because I saw the four, but that's the tier. Uh, you got six different units here, and so basically you can uh, complete the brawny bonus by excluding any two of them at any point in time. If you run all six, they do get the full benefit of the brawny bonus. Um, now, the way it works here is that each individual... Uh, each individual alliance, um, they have very different benefits and some go very well together. Like for instance, traditionally, Brutes and Brawnies went well together because as you'll see, Axe is consistent amongst Brutes and Brawnies. That'll result in an opportunity for you to have um, uh, greater alliance synergies while having fewer units on the board. Um, so there are a multitude of different alliances here. Um, now, I'm not going to break down each and every single one because that'll take forever. But what you need to understand is that uh, some of them, especially if you're new to the game are uh, generally very straightforward to play like if you're relatively new to the game I would suggest you run druids because druids they what they do is they give you a little more strength in the early game they top off near the end of the game but what they do is they upgrade your units your lowest uh, tier uh, druid unit to a one or two star bonus so basically uh, sorry one star bonus for one or two units and what you got here is you have Magnus in the front back in the game uh, since he was removed um, you know Magnus being a savage druid there uh, so he's been uh, added back since he was removed earlier in the beta and if you run any four of these, let's say two of these are two stars and one of these is, uh, no, two of these are one star, both of them will get upgraded to two stars and you'll have a full board of two stars. Um, and again, there are so many different alliances. Now you have the four healers, you have to run these four, so you're going to have a much more difficult time getting those four healers in there with a variety of different alliances. But basically, the primary focus of this game is to figure out which alliances you are uh, easy, are going to be able to uh, kind of complete and uh, put those units on the board, position them appropriately, and hope for the best. Um, so basically, uh, you know, with someone like knights, knights are unique because they have to be attacked from the front and within one cell of an allied knight. That means that they have to be clumped together. They have to be together if they are dispersed and then what will happen is, oh, the Dota and Underlords network is currently being updated. Uh, so if they are dispersed, um, you're not going to have the opportunity to... Um, to benefit from that reduction in uh, in damage. So it's very important that you keep them together. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to the heroes. Now, what you need to understand about heroes is there are a lot of them. As you can see, there are an absolute ton of heroes. Now, the way it works is this. Heroes are rotated out with each season. So uh, the previous season had a bunch of heroes uh, rotated out and some new ones back in. Like, for instance, Arc Warden's back. Nice to see him back. He's a summoner and a primordial, which is great. We have multiple primordials at tier 1, including Tiny, Razor, and Arc Warden. So primordial's a little more interesting now because traditionally primordials really lost strength in the late game. But here we are at a situation where primordials might actually be able to carry you in the early game so that you can sell them off later and move to a more powerful alliance. But... 
what you have is you have tier one so these units are relatively strong but they might have relatively low impact on the board at any given time like a lot of them have for instance a crystal maiden her ability is a single target magical ability has a uh, you know a relatively decent cooldown but it's only going to freeze someone in, uh, in place for three four or five seconds at uh, three three stars so basically their impact can be gen uh, generally kind of reduced some of them scale very well into late game like razor if you happen to be going mages because of the increased in scaled uh, uh, magic damage but Here's something you need to understand that there are lots of uh, tier tier one units in the board. So if you see multiple people going a lot of tier one units, you're still okay. Now, when you move to tier two, these units cost more. So tier one units cost one gold. Tier units uh, tier two units cost two gold. They're also rarer. There are fewer tier two units available. So uh, they're still not overly contested. So if uh, you know you see a lot of people going uh, nature's profit, for instance, you can still run nature's profit and druids and summoners because there's still enough on there that you know multiple players can get uh, two or three star. Uh, nature's profits out of there now the problem is is when you start getting into tier three four and five now these are very rare which means that if one person already has like a two star axe it's probably going to be very unlikely that you're able to achieve a two star axe and so uh, because you need three uh pairs of each star level so three one star pairs to get get a one two star and three two star pairs to get one three star the result of that is either of any of these units at tier five it's very unlikely that you'll be able to complete them if other people are also competing for them as well and the same is for tier four as well but just to a le uh, lesser extent still very rare units uh, also the way it works in dota underlords you can only access the different tiers of units as you level up i'll explain that in the core gameplay mechanics as i show you how to level up but basically you won't have access to tier three units uh, at the start of the game nor will you have uh, access to tier four or five until much later in the game uh and so very uh, you got to keep that in mind okay um also what i'll just mention here is units also can be equipped with uh with items uh, there are a ton of items um, if there's interest I can do a total breakdown of each individual item not for the sake of this video though but basically what you're going to do is you're going to be dragging and dropping items onto various uh, units uh, with new with season one is each item uh, selection can be re-rolled once so if you see a whole bunch of options that you don't like you can re-roll them uh, basically there are a few that scale very well in the late game something like 25% uh, evasion the talisman of evasion is uh, fantastic because even in the late game hey it's still 25% evasion uh, whereas other ones like the uh, you know the headdress 20 mana per second is not overly great so there are definitely tiers within each individual tier like you know uh, void stone's great with uh, any mage comp k is fantastic with mage comps as well um, but uh, you know there are certainly some items that are better than others um, as you move through the t uh, the rarity you uh, can uh, access them later in the game so the first uh, few you know you won't get access to anything other than tier one and two and then as you move later in the game you'll get access to three and four and finally in the late game you'll have access to the game breaking uh, tier five which can have a very large impact on your board. All right, and you have your four Underlords, which are Anessix, Joel, Eno, and Hobgin. Now, each of them provides a very unique uh, benefit to your team. Anessix is a healer and a summoner who drops a golem. Joel is a frontline combatant who basically sustains your uh, your team and helps to kind of tank that frontline. Hobgin is a damage dealer and also can boost your... your uh, your kind of allies attack speed and Eno is just an absolute maniac he basically poisons and bounces around and heals and it's very very uh, elusive he's very hard to uh, to get we're gonna do a full breakdown later in the game uh, in the video but overall these are your four options if you need some tanky uh, tankiness up front you go with Joel if you need uh, someone to be bounced around healing and just doing uh, overall crazy stuff you're gonna go Eno if you want some uh, damage dealing with like mages and uh, you know stuff like that you want Hobgin and an Essex is a good all-around healer and summoner so now let's talk about core gameplay mechanics. All right, so in Dota Underlords, there's five primary modes, one of which the brand new uh, White Spire City Crawl. So basically, I haven't begun yet, but this City Crawl is going to be a kind of adventure-based mode where you unlock cosmetics and different things for Dota Underlords. So we're going to be checking this out at some point as well. But what I want to talk about is the core fight mechanics now. So you have four modes here. You have training, which allows you to kind of go against, uh, you know, play the tutorial if you're brand new to the game. You also have freestyle mode, which allows you to kind of do some custom uh, board stuff. If you're new to my channel, I do uh, freestyle mode for a lot of my testing and for my builds of the week videos which are uh, you know very helpful for anyone trying to kind of uncover which builds will be uh, beneficial for them the duos mode is fantastic duos mode is one that you can play with a friend you guys uh, go onto a team together and you compete against other teams for supremacy you have knockout mode which is absolutely fantastic knockout mode is basically uh, you have uh, it's like you start at level five you start with some uh, you pick like some core units and then what you do is you put them on the board and you quickly try and level up you only need two uh, of each individual unit to level them up it's a much 
much faster paced mode and once you lose four rounds you're eliminated knockout mode i'm gonna have a lot of videos on that as well but standard is the primary mode that i think most people are interested in uh basically what standard mode is it's a you know 30 to 35 40 minute long match where you're going to be competing with seven other players uh to basically build the best composition you can so let's actually get started here so we're going to begin our match uh this is a cpu match simply i'm a sad clown uh simply so that i can uh pause and explain what's going on here okay so first of all when when you first start up a match here uh you're you have a few different things going so if you're so if you're against an online uh, online opponent you're not gonna be able to pause or skip ahead or anything like that so for the time being i'm just going to show you how this works so you have the shop here the way the shop works is uh you're offered five individual units of which you can buy you can buy them in any uh you know one of a few ways you can click them and they'll automatically be added to your uh to your bench this is called the bench here uh you can also drag and drop them onto the field of play um and every time you uh you know grab them, you are spending gold. So you start with five. Um, what this is here, this is the amount of gold you have left. So I can buy either any of these. So I'm going to buy Dazzle as well. So I'm going to drag Dazzle on here and I'm going to put, uh, you know, well, this is not the best lineup here, but we'll do this. Um, also, I have uh, I have one gold remaining, so I can actually buy either Razor or Weaver. So, you know, what? I'm going to buy a Weaver as well. But now that I'm out of gold, I'm not able to buy uh, Razor. So basically what's going to happen now, I'm actually just going uh, to jump ahead. So my units come out on the board and they actually uh, combat. Now my active alliances are Demon, so uh, he's going to get a 50% uh, bonus damage for each ally Demon, but uh, he's the only one out there, so you're not getting much of a benefit. But we also have Heartless, where during this battle, all enemies will have negative 4 armor, and that is shown right there. Uh, the result of that is because we have the, uh, the Shadow Demon, who is Heartless, and we have the Drow Ranger, who is also Heartless, Vigilant, and a Hunter as well. So let's see how we do here. Um, if you lose a round, um, you basically lose health depending on it. So we're going to lose this round. I'll show you. So we're going to lose two health because the Shadow Demon's at one star and the Witch Doctor's at one star. That means we're going to lose two health. Now you can click these buttons here to kind of just, you know, uh, you know, use your uh, your yo's and your hots and stuff like that. Now you can also customize your board on the edge. So here's the item selection. So we're given three items. Let's say I don't want any of these. I can re-roll once. I'm going to click re-roll here and now I have to pick one of these. I'm actually going to pick the Talisman of Evasion. Um, and I'm going to, okay, okay, so let's just, I'm going to pause here. Oh, I am paused, never mind. So, a few good things happened here. So now, we're in a position where uh, we have uh, a couple different units, uh, units and options here so we have shadow demon and you'll notice that there's a little logo here which tells me that this shadow demon um is uh, i have a shadow demon already so if i buy the shadow demon i now am increasing the opportunity for me to get him to two stars weaver as well now what i'm going to do here is i'm actually going to take pudge i'm going to drag pudge onto the board i'm going to take dazzle off because pudge is a frontline kind of meaty unit i'm going to give him the talisman of evasion i'm going to position my units like this i'll explain positioning a little more later but what you have here is because I lost, I actually get access to a free reroll. This reroll is uh, something that's kind of like a catch-up mechanic. So if you, if you know, if you're having a rough time and losing, you get to reroll for free. So what I'm actually going to do, I'm actually going to sell off my uh, my weavers. I'm going to take these two crystal maidens and I'm going to reroll. Let's see what we get. Ah, I get a maiden. So basically, I don't have enough money, right? Ah, uh, this is perfect. I don't have enough money to buy this maiden. She's glowing here, and there's two maiden symbols, which tells me that I can level her to two stars, which is quite significant because if I level her up, she doubles her health, she doubles her damage. Per second and her ability is significantly stronger i want to level her up so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my dazzle who's worth two gold and i'm going to sell them uh, the result of that is now that i'm going to uh, take my crystal maiden i'm going to buy her there we go and i'm going to drag her over here perfect so now I have a two-star crystal maiden so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take off draw ranger i'm going to put the crystal maiden on and let's uh let's uh, well, basically, it would count down, but I'm just going to advance here by hitting that button. So I'm against someone, this uh, bot who has Warlock and a Champion. So let's see how we do. I actually think with a two-star Crystal Maiden here, as denoted by the two stars, we should have no problem. Now, on the right side here above my head, you'll see that there are damage charts. These are telling us who's doing the most damage. The green is us and the red is the opposing team the lighter blue color that is uh magic based uh damage green is being the auto attack and any dark blue is like items um you can also switch this to damage per second the amount of damage taken healing provided which we're not doing any healing and uh the amount of kills gotten by any individual hero disable time which is basically like stuns and stuff like that i like to keep it on damage though now we got our money there uh now we have some options here what i'll do is i'll actually sell off pudge 
I'm going to take Juggernaut. Now, Juggernaut is a three cost unit because he's a tier three unit. So he's a little better. So I'm going to drag him into place here. Um, and I'm actually going to put uh, Shadow Demon on the bench. And I'm going to put Bristle back on instead and put him up front. The reason why I did that. Oh, no, I almost forgot to put my item on there. But the reason why I did that was because um, I gained the Brawny bonus by having both the Juggernaut and the Bristle back in play. Uh, by doing that, what I've done is I've created a situation where for each time they get a kill, they add 15 uh, hit points to their uh, life total. So you want to get them on as early as possible. This is a tight fight here. I don't know because the Warlock is healing. We're going to lose this. So we're going to get a free reroll, which is absolutely fine there. But um, I'll just give you a couple uh, other uh, major important things as well. So let's wait till this round. I'm going to pause here. So we got our money. Uh, so basically, now, I'm going to take Juggernaut as well, but let me just say, let's say I don't want any of these units here, so I take Juggernaut. Let me explain something called blacklisting. The way this works is, um, anytime you have a shop, right, and you buy uh, units from it, and let's say you have a unit that say you do, you, you're really looking for, like we really want Juggernauts. We pull them out, but we don't want these units. Now, this doesn't apply to free reroll, so I'm going to use this free reroll, and what's going to happen is, is I can get the same units again, but I'm going to take this, uh, this Drow Ranger, but now... Because I'm going to now pay money for this reroll, the way this works is called blacklisting. So Omni Knight, Dazzle, Magnus, and Ember Spirit cannot be in the next shop. Drow Ranger can because I bought her. But when I pay two gold to reroll my shop, it is impossible that any of these four units can be in it. This can be used intelligently to maximize the chances of you pulling the units you want. Like for instance, Maiden. I want Maiden. So if I buy Maiden here, let's say I want another Maiden. I don't want Storm Spirit or any of these units. I reroll again. But here's the thing. The units that I initially blacklisted the first time can come back now. They only exclude the units that are existing in the current shop. So if I roll again, now I have Snapfire, who's a Brawny. So I'll take Snapfire. I'm going to sell off Drow. So I'm going to drag her over here or hit E on a keyboard. Uh, but I'll drag because those of you guys on uh, mobile will want to know that as well. And what I'll do is I'll pick up the... Uh, what am I doing? Oh, no, I, so I can... No, what I'll do here is I'll explain uh, this. So I'm going to sell off Snapfire as well. And I'm just going to explain one other thing here. So then you have uh, your shop, okay? So you're able to level up your shop as well. So basically the way it works, you have a current level and a next level. So right now we're at level 3. It says 5 above, 5 gold, because it costs 5 gold to go up 5 experience points. So... There's a few things that happen when you level up. When I invest the 5 gold, what's going to happen is you're going to notice that I'll be able to add an additional unit onto the board. Moreover, when I level up, I'm going to be increasing the chances for rarer units. So, my tier 1 units right now, I have a 50% chance of pulling them in the shop. Tier 2, 35. Tier 3, 15. And uh, when I level up, what you're going to see is that's actually going to change. When I level up, I can actually add a 4th player... Uh, fourth fourth person on the board. I'm going to add a second juggernaut here. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look over here. So I don't have enough gold to buy uh, more experience points. But what I can do is show you that my tier one uh, opportunities have gone to 40%, but my tier three has gone up to 25. When I level up the next level, level five, which is costing uh, more gold. So now it's going to cost me 15 gold to get all the way up. Uh, basically, my opportunity for tier one units reduces. And now I have a 5% chance of tier four units. So leveling up not only allows you to get more units on the board, but it gives you access to uh, higher rarity units, which is important because if you're running any builds that were, that have very contested high tier units, you almost want to get there first because you want to be able to grab those units because um, as you pull them out of the uh, the pool, players other players have a far less opportunity to pull those away from you as well. So basically, you know, uh, you know, tier five units when you pull them out of the pool, right? There's very few of them, so that reduces the chances that the opponents are going to be able to get them as well. Uh, so so it's very, very important. So let's just do the next round here. One thing I will explain is you can click through different people's boards by clicking this button here. You get an opportunity to see what other people are doing. It can be very helpful if you're trying to determine what uh, what other people are doing and what their boards look like, what kind of uh, units they're targeting. But more beneficial is to actually hit the tab key. When you hit the tab key, what you get is you get a breakdown of what's going on in the game, which units are being used, which alliances the other people are going, which units are on their bench, what contraptions they had, and which underlords uh, they have selected. Okay, so there's a lot of very important information on this board um, also so oh, we get to pick a new uh, new item I'm going to take the Vanguard and I'm gonna put it oop I picked him by accident we're gonna take a bristle back another maiden we're gonna blacklist this shop 
And, um, hmm, okay, that's fine. We're moving towards a three-star maiden, potentially. I'm actually uh, going to uh, resume here with the clock. But as you can see, we have uh, three gold. Now, I'm going to explain interest in a moment. But what I'm going to drag and drop my Vanguard into place here. I'm actually going to, you know what, I'm going to drag it onto the uh, Bristleback. Unique to Underlords, unlike, uh, you know, for instance, Team Fight Tactics, you can move items uh, anytime you want. So once you apply an, an item to a person, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to keep it on them. Uh, so there's a few other things as well. You can also emote as well. Uh, you can emote from the bottom here. Once you have an Underlord, they're a little more animated. But uh, overall, what you're looking to do is you're looking to win as often as you can. Now, this particular person is at level 3, which I can see by the top left here. And also, they only have 3 units on the board, which is somewhat problematic for them because I was able to absolutely truck them and troll them by hitting the, uh, the button right there. So this guy's on a streak, you can tell because he's on fire, so we'll give him some love there. We got a new shop. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you about interest. Now, there's a running economy in this game. The way it works is that up to 30 gold, you can apply interest to your account. So basically the way it works is like this. I have 11 gold. By staying above 10, at the end of the round, I'm guaranteed to get one additional gold in interest. That increases to two additional gold at 20 and three additional gold at 30. So it's very important that you use your uh, economy very wisely. One of the most common beginner errors in Dota Underlords is leveling up too fast or just constantly smashing the reroll button and blowing up your economy. And I'll show you in a second because once we win here, it's going to give us a breakdown as to how we got all our gold. Uh, also, buying and spending. So let's say I'm at 11 gold here. Uh, I'll wait a sec. I'll demonstrate that next. But what we're going to do is, so we have seven, one interest, one winning streak, one victory. So it gives you an idea of how much gold we got. Now we're at 21. I'm going to wait as well, but let's say I want to buy a few of these units. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for the round to start in 10 seconds. So what I'm doing is by waiting till the round to start, uh, to start I'm going to lock in my interest at the start of the battle, which allows me to buy whatever I want. So let's watch. So I locked in right here. So my interest is locked in at 2 gold. I'm going to buy all these guys. And now I'm at 14. I'm still going to get 2 interest because what's happened now is that... Um, I've locked in the two uh, the two interest, and any purchases made while the fight is occurring does not impact your interest, does not impact your economy. So it can be very beneficial to make purchases after the round begins in order to ensure that uh, you're making maximum uh, amount of money. And I'll uh, I'll kind of demonstrate this to you once we get into this next round. See, we still get the two interest despite the fact I had less than 20 gold. Now, if you're in a situation where you're at like 25, you might want to sell off some units on the board to get to 30 so that you can maximize the amount of interest you get. Part of Dota Underlords, uh, kind of the skill cap, is determining when you want to spend your money and when you want to hold your money. So it's really important that you kind of become accustomed to figuring out how you want to use your interest. You can also see how other people are using their funds by looking over here. So for instance, we have Tammy bot right here. Uh, you know, they have 31 gold. So a lot of these one, uh, these bots are right now, they are uh, they're using their interest, they're using their economy, so that's working well for them. However, we have Peter here. Peter has used uh, most of his economy up. He's up to five uh, units on board, but he has only seven gold so he does not have an active economy and the result of that is that he's going to be getting less interest over time which can be showed by the net worth so peter here has a net worth of 61 but we can see that uh, a uh, adria here has been doing a very good job maintaining their economy so they have a net worth, net worth of 75 so in the long scheme of things, it is very important that you protect your economy and determine when it is you want to re-roll, mostly determined by how much health you have. Health is a resource. All right, now I'm going to give a quick primer on unit positioning. So we have a bunch of different units here, um, all of which are very, very unique. Now, a bunch of them, four of them in fact, are melee units. So let's put them up front here and then we have our ranged units at the back. Now, naturally you're going to assume that the ranged units should be at the back and the melee units should be at the front. Uh, so basically what you're going to want to do is you want to pay attention though as you become more advanced as to which units are actually doing which tasks. Like, for instance, the tree protector has something called a leech seed, which means that any unit one cell uh, within range of him is going to heal when he casts his spell. That generally means that you want people one cell within him. So you want to have people kind of bunched in within one cell like this. The reason for for that is because when he casts his leech seed everyone within one cell is going to heal if he's by himself like this right 
and he casts his ability, even if you have like your melee units up front, you're like, oh, you know, I got good positioning here. Here we go. Um, he's not going to get any healing from uh, the Treme Protector's Leech Seed. He's not, and neither is he. The only one that's going to benefit is the Crystal Maiden. So it is important you bear in mind how you want units positioned. Now, generally speaking, what you want to do is you want to have your strongest, tankiest unit on the inside left side. Um, so what you're going to want to do in this situation, but where it's really unique with the uh, Treme Protector because of the fact you're going to heal all around. So what we'll do is we'll have Treant here. We'll have the uh, Juggernaut here, and we'll have the uh, the Life Stealer here, and we'll put Bristle back here. Now, what we're going to want to do is we're going to put the item here on Tree and Protector. The Tree and Protector is this is going to help him kind of stay alive. It has increased health, and it's going to keep him healing. What we're going to do is because Juggernaut here is a little vulnerable on the edge, we're going to make sure he has the Talisman of Evasion. It wouldn't make sense to put it on Juggernaut uh, on Bristle back here. We want it on someone who's uh, most likely to get impacted by the uh, opposing board. You can even maximize this by spreading them across the edge here because it's far more likely that these two are going to be impacted by the center of the board than these two. These could have units lined up here, but it's much more likely that Juggernaut and Tree Protector are going to take the most damage. From there, you want to have your Crystal Maiden and your Morphling in position. Uh, you want them behind your uh, your your kind of tanks, and you want them safe. Um, you don't want to. Well, I mean, Morphling's a unique case because of his waveform. What he can do is he can cast across the enemy team. So you can put him on the front line if you want an early cast. But generally speaking, what you want is you want to put him in a position where he can fire uh, from a safe position. You want to have your strongest units on the uh, inside left or the inside right, kind of in the most vulnerable positions. And then you want your Tree Protector central so that uh, you can find success when you're fighting here. Now, in this case here, we also have the Brute bonus. Now, Brutes prefer to put the attack on people without the debuff, so we spread them out. We have Tree and Protector here, and uh, Life Stealer on the other end. That means that Life Stealer is going to approach from this side, and Tree and Protector is going to approach from this side, and apply the negative uh, uh, damage bonus to debuff, I should say, to the opposing team. So, uh, there are a lot of advanced mechanics to uh, positioning, but overall that's more or less the basis of it. You want to make sure you have your strongest, most capable units up front, and then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have... Alright, perfect! You're going to want to have your tank units in the back. So. We have an opportunity to choose our Underlord. What I want to do here, we have a lot of tanks. We don't need money tanks. So a good starter, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to recommend Eno. If you're uh, brand new to the game, go with Eno because he is highly elusive. He tends to stay alive. Uh, what we're going to do here is I'll uh, explain a couple things to you. So Eno, for instance, uh, oh, I'm kind of blocking it here, but what he does, he has an escape artist move. So once he hits certain uh, damage thresholds, he's actually going to jump off the board and jump back on, which resets uh, his damage targeting. He also heals and steals items for the opposing team. Now, here's an important thing to understand. We're only at level 6, so we have a 10% a temp, a chance to pull a tier 4 unit, and we have pulled a tier 4 unit. Now, what you're going to see here is the Lone Druid has a Savage and Druid uh, buff. That means that if we put Lone Druid onto our bench here, and we put him on instead of, say, Morphling, so let's sell off Morphling, and we put Lone Druid in, we're actually going to achieve both the Savage and the Druid buffs. So we're going to get an increased amount of damage across all our units, and we're also going to get a free star upgrade on one of our units as well. It's extremely important that uh, you add a very high tier unit like the, the Lone Druid, who's also a summoner. He's going to put a bear on the field. Let's see this bear, and watch this. So we actually just got, because of the Druid bonus, he's at two stars, which means that we're going to have a two star bear on the field as soon as he takes some damage. Watch Eno. Eno's going to jump away. He's getting poked by the Ember spirit and the uh, terror blade let's see him jump there he goes he's gone so he reset his damage now he's back into a safe spot that's why if you're new to the game i really do recommend eno he does an absolutely fantastic job of staying alive whereas an essex and hobgen can get blown up before they even do their primary casts so anyways what you see here is an example of how getting a high tier unit on the board can have a big significant impact on your ability to play the game. I'm win streaking pretty hard here because while well, they're not playing particularly good. Uh, another couple things I should mention is let's say you want to get Magnus on there but you don't have enough money. You can lock the shop to ensure that uh, you know there's uh, that shop remains there even at the end of the round. So when the start of the new round, let's say you run out of money and you want to get Tidehunter, you know you can lock the shop so you're guaranteed uh, these units the next round. You also have the encyclopedia here so if you're really confused as to what Bristleback does, you can get de uh, detailed information here by clicking on the encyclopedia and then you have the alliances, items, and the glossary effects as well, all of which is extremely useful. There's one other thing I need to mention. So, the idea of 9xing. So, let me explain how this works. So, basically, we talked about how interest can work with uh, the, with regards to the fact that I have 29 gold here. Now, I got 29 gold. You're thinking, Alex, what are you doing? You didn't get 3 interest. You could have. Had you been at 30, you would have been guaranteed 3 interest. That's true. However, when we're at any 9, 
the win uh, bonus gold we get for winning. So we get one bonus gold for winning is applied to the um, to the uh, interest calculation. So right now I'm win streaking. I'm on fire here. So if I'm able to win this match, I'm actually going to get three interest because the one bonus gold is going to get me to 30, which is going to apply to the interest threshold. So I am going to win this here because I got this fantastic lone druid doing work. So we're going to win here. And what you're going to notice is that I am going to get three interest despite the fact that I'm less than 30 because of the fact that I won. So three max interest reached. Um, I won, so I get the bonus interest. That's one other thing I wanted to make sure you understood. All right, now, let's dive with the four primary Underlords. It's what the game's named after anyways. So let's dive with Anessix first. Anessix is a ranged Underlord, and what you want to do is you want to use her whenever you have a very good front line, but you also would benefit from her healing abilities. There are two versions of Anessix. There's damage support Anessix and healing support. She always has the passive ability. She'll always have a little archer that spawns by her side. If you pick the damage support variant of Anessix, you're going to get the end of medicine, which is basically going to provide a 35% attack, uh, attack damage bonus to all your units and also enthrall so for six seconds as many units in range that they can are going to focus fire one particular opposing hero and if you kill them within that six seconds they resurrect to be fighting on your side alternatively healing support in Essex will provide you with healing she sacrifices some of her own health in order to provide healing to the opposing team she also summons a demonic golem who is super strong and stuns the enemy line uh, the golem is absolutely nuts the risk you run with the much like Hobgin is that if she dies because she's a little squishy and she sacrifices her own health she might never uh, actually cast her demonic golem and that is a death nail to your game if she's not casting her ultimate ability and dying and the opposing team is casting their ultimate ability you could very well consider yourself a loss uh, moving on there we have Joel this uh, drunkard with wine basically the way it works here Joel is a melee uh, unit he fights in the front and he has the passive ability of gaining armor per adjacent unit enemy or uh, otherwise so basically the way it works is that you want to have him surrounded by as many units as you can in order to increase the amount of armor he has um, and if he's an aggressive tank he basically gets uh, you know 50% damage reduction in attack speed and lifesteal um, it's fantastic aggressive tank is one of my favorite builds because what he does is he maintains that front line because he's doing so much damage and he's life stealing for so much health he basically just keeps that front line alive Fantastic in like mage compositions where you need someone to hold that front line and barrels of fun Barrels come flying up off the board and they do tons of damage to your health is interesting as well uh, Basically what he does is he kind of spreads out the amount of damage being done It's great with healing compositions because basically the healers are able to uh, to basically top up all your uh, your units While Joel is kind of holding that front line down. So a very uh, interesting hero melee unit up front We have Eno if you're new to the game and just starting I do recommend you pick Eno almost every time uh, the reason why is because Eno is just so damn straightforward. Uh, his escape ability, uh, you know, escape artist, his passive ability, I should say, basically is fantastic. It keeps him alive. It helps him to keep moving around the board. He always casts his rabbit furball, uh, sorry, his uh, death spin and his yoink. He's always doing work with his abilities because he's constantly escaping. He's one of the ones, if you're still getting used to positioning, you can really benefit from. Healing stealing is great. Uh, he's going to keep your units alive while stealing any enemy uh, items. It helps to really uh, do and uh, have a good impact on the board. And uh, rabbit furball uh, the death spin has been reduced in impact. Um, it used to be a little crazier, but uh, throughout the beta, it got toned down. In season one, it's been toned down as well. But overall, Eno is fantastic. A great pick every single time. And finally, we have Hobgen. Hobgen is a pyromaniac, and basically what he does is he his attacks light people on fire for three seconds, so he does uh, damage uh, over time there. He has Implosion, which basically allows him to shoot a fireball, which is split across different uh, different units. This is High Damage Dealer. High Damage Dealer works fantastic in mage compositions, because what's going to happen is the mage compositions will benefit from the fact that he uh, he has the uh, the added magic damage uh, bonus. So these are magical abilities, so the mage, uh, mage bonuses of of uh, increased uh, damage uh, by magical attacks benefits Hobgin as well uh, support damage uh, dealer you have shockwave and finally let's go crazy which any sustained build like brawny builds for instance uh, basically what he does is he greatly buffs the attack speed of the uh, your uh, your units which greatly increases the opportunity for you to find success on the battlefield because if you have an extended fight and your guys are attacking way faster than the opposing team you're more likely to win 
All right, guys, that is my quick primer on Dota Underlords. I know I went through a lot of stuff very fast. Um, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. There's so much more to this game that could be taken in in like advanced guides and stuff like that. I do recommend you keep an eye out for my Builds of the Week videos because they really do help you to kind of figure out what builds you can do and what can be successful. Overall, though, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you have questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer. This is one of my favorite games of all time, and I'm happy that you're here to share it with us. Take care, everyone, and have yourselves a wonderful day.